Hi everyone, my name is Chelsea. Welcome to Little Mountain Ranch. I'm very happy to have you here with us today. Dan and I are just heading up to our spring. So we have gravity fed spring water here. So basically what that means is we have a spring that is up the mountain here and it's piped down to our house and um, we don't have to have power for our water, which is really, really nice. But there are a couple of maintenance things that have to be done every year with, or a couple of times a year actually with our spring. One of the things that we need to do for maintenance with the spring is it has a box that's kind of like a well that the water runs into before it gets piped down to our house and that can fill up with silt. So a couple of times a year, a year we need to pump that out. But last year, was it last year we built the new one? The new well? I think so. Yeah, last year we built a new um, well box for it and it's nice and tight and solid so we weren't getting a lot of silt coming in from the side and because the water kind of seeps in from everywhere up where the spring is and that has cut down on the amount that we've had to pump it out by a ton which is fantastic so we are just heading up right now to do our last check before winter sets in to see how the spring is looking it's beautiful up in here so quiet in the winter time hey Everything, all the sounds are kind of muffled. <laughs> big tree up here, isn't it beautiful? We have a couple of big old fir trees in our forest that are just gorgeous. There's not a lot of old growth fir left in this area anymore, but we have a few, look at that one. So beautiful. This is the overflow for our spring. Isn't it beautiful? Oh my gosh, it's looking so clear. I don't even think we're gonna need to pump that out this year. Mm. Looks fantastic. So you see those little pine needles there? This hole over here acts like a skimmer. So all of those will go and out the overflow that I just showed you a second ago. And then this is the pipe for the water to go down to our house. It looks so good. You did a really, really good job on building this. It's fantastic. Teamwork. So this box, what was there before and why we were having such issues with all of the silt is that it was a really old box, probably built. When would you say that was built? The old box. So yeah, anyway, a long time ago. And it was all caving in on the sides. So all of the silt and everything from the sides was getting into the well box as well. And now that we have it nice and tight like that, it is saving us having to pump it out this fall, which is fantastic. So what our plan is for this is we wanna take the overflow and run it down this way so that it runs as a creek through our property so we can have running water through our creek or through our property. And like next summer, yeah, it's an, it, that's where it was originally. So there's a, an old ditch there that's still there that we could clean out. So that's a project we'd really like to do next summer. I would love to have running water through the property. It didn't feel that cold when we first got out here, but I am cold now. Dan is going to be taking the kids into town to run some errands and do some lessons this afternoon. And I am going to stay home and make shepherd's pie for dinner. Some like, it's like a cozy stick to your bones kind of meal. So I'm gonna do shepherd's pie and then we are going to make a cobbler. I think I'm gonna do a cherry peach cobbler and it's another one of my mama's recipes and then I'm going to make some homemade ice cream to go with it. We eat so differently in the winter time than we do in the summer. We're really seasonal eaters, hey? Like in the winter it's all soups and stews and kind of stick to your bones food and then in the summer we eat tons of salad and barbecued like chicken and stuff like that. Pulled pork sandwiches. It's like, so, yeah, steak, <laughs> steak, that's our favorite. But yeah, we really do eat seasonally. So we don't have as many greens in the winter time as I would like. So one of the things that we, I've mentioned this before, but 
we really want to improve upon our grow room space where I start all my seeds in the spring and start growing greens in there as well. We do buy um, greens every week at the grocery store still and try to have a couple salads a week, but not nearly as much as we do in the summer, that's for sure. Okay, we are back inside and I have finally warmed up. I don't know why, but I got absolutely chilled to the bone outside and it's not even that cold. It's still around the minus 10 degrees Celsius, which if I remember correctly, that was 15 degrees Fahrenheit, right? I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Anyway, it's not even that cold, but I just, whew, I was freezing. So now we're back inside. We're gonna go down to the pantry and pick some groceries for making this food. So we're making the shepherd's pie and the cobbler. I already have the potatoes on the cook stove over here. And we actually need to load this up with some more firewood. Whenever you're trying to boil anything on a cook stove, you really have to keep it going pretty hot in order to keep it hot enough to boil that water. And I let this go down a little too much. Close to boiling, but not quite there yet. Did I mention that we got the potatoes from the root cellar earlier on this morning and got them peeled up and put on the stove so that that part of the prep work was all done. All I need from the pantry right now is some canned peaches and the kids asked for peach blueberry cobbler instead of peach cherry. So we're gonna get some canned blueberry. Okie dokie. Canned peaches. One of the blueberries, actually, I think these ones are Saskatoons. Yeah, that one's Saskatoon. This one back here is blueberry. Pulling all the jars forward. I just think it looks so much prettier when the shelves are all faced, don't you? Someone was pointing out um, to me, I think on my pantry tour video, that the reason that they don't face their shelves like this is because they can't see when they're running low on things, but that um, isn't a problem for me because I run a different kind of pantry. I only can for a couple of months every year. So usually from August, September, October is when I get most of my canning done. And then all of this is to last for that 12 month period until I start canning again the following year. So I don't usually have to worry about things going bad or running out to get in the habit of doing it though because I, um, this isn't how I have always done it. But I do really, really, really love the way that it looks. Okay, so we have this. Now we need to grab some onions from over here and I'm out of the yellow ones. So we'll use a couple of the white ones. I decided today that I am going to use some frozen veggies mixed veggies for adding into the shepherd's pie because I am not in the mood to chop carrots today. <laughs> oh, you know what else I forgot to get though? Was the, um, what is it? The tomato paste. <laughs> the tomato paste that I um, bagged up the other day. Lots of questions about where I got that from. We have a store called The Real Canadian Superstore here and um, that's where, let me need more than that, we'll get two. And uh, that's where I get um, the number 10 cans of tomato paste. And I'm pretty sure you can find them at Costco too. So what I'm gonna do now is get my ground beef, which I have thawing here. I remembered two dinners in a row to take my meat out of the freezer this morning. This is one of the major benefits of filming YouTube videos in my kitchen. Where are my kitchen scissors? My kitchen scissors are forever going missing. One sec. What I was saying is that um, doing YouTube videos has me much better at planning ahead because usually I think about what I'm gonna film in the morning when I get up early before the kids get up and I have a cup of tea and I just kind of mull over my day. 
and think about what recipes I'm going to make or whatever. And since I'm doing that kind of planning, I just at that time go out and grab whatever meat I need. I know we've been using a lot of ground beef lately and I actually do love using ground beef. It's so convenient, but normally I do half pork, half like half ground pork, half ground beef in pretty much every recipe, but I'm out of ground pork right now and will be for another two weeks. So that's why I'm using straight up ground beef. So what we're gonna do here is grab one of our frying pans. I love lodge pans. They are my favorite. And we'll pop that on there and grab our meat. frying up and then we'll go over and chop our onions up. Do you guys remember how a couple of months ago I was talking about how much I wanted a freeze dryer and how it was kind of like a homestead fantasy appliance of mine? At the time I did not anticipate that I would be able to get one for probably at least another year. Well, it turns out that the company that makes them, which is Harvest Right, has um, decided to send me a freeze dryer. <laughs> Can you believe it? Oh my goodness, I, I literally, when, it, when I got the email about that, I, um, Dan said he hadn't seen me that excited since I was a teenager. <laughs> Dan's known me since I was a teenager and uh, I thought that was pretty funny. I was really, really excited and I am thrilled beyond belief and Dan is actually in town picking up our freeze dryer right now. So I am very excited to be able to experiment with that. I did a lot of research before um, deciding I even wanted one and spoke with many people who have them. Um, trying to make the decision of whether or not I thought that it was going to be a worthwhile investment for us And I think because of the type of food preserving that I do and the quantity that I preserve that it's actually going to be hugely uh, beneficial And also increase the amount of food that I can store Over the long term and also I think it's going to help with waste because you can really freeze dry anything even small portions of leftovers I guess I can take these off. Um, small por uh, portions of leftovers and things like that. And I was even thinking even for my adult kids when we have a small portion of say beef stew or something like that leftover that's not enough for our whole family that I could freeze dry that up. For um, my kids to start their own food storage, my adult kids, there is just unlimited possibility for me, at least in my imagination. We'll see how that translates into um, actual reality when it comes to that, but I'm so excited to take you guys along with that whole adventure with learning how to do it. The first thing that we're going to be doing is actually building an area for the freeze dryer and we're going to use some of that reclaimed wood to build a table for it. And that'll actually be happening right away. It is a huge project because we're going to be putting it in our power room where we're going to be installing our solar system. We have a solar system, we just have not had the opportunity to actually get it installed yet. And um, so we're gonna be putting it in that room. Basically it's just framed walls um, with concrete because we've gutted that room out. So we have a huge project there, but it should be fun. And I think it'll look beautiful when it's done. If Dan has anything to do with it, it will because everything he builds is just so beautiful. Our ground beef is now frying up. I bought these little bamboo tables to, um, and they're on wheels so that I could have a counter space beside the cook stove where I'm working because there's obviously no counter here. This isn't actually in the kitchen. The cook stove is more kind of in the living room space than it is the kitchen space. And these have worked so well for just being able to tuck back there and then pull forward when I need it. This is going to be the easiest supper <laughs> to make because a lot of the prep work is already done. So now we'll just set our veggies aside and we'll get right into getting dessert made. My mother-in-law found these awesome big trays, which I literally use all the time. I would like to get a couple more um, pans this size because they're just perfect 
for the um, amount of people that I am usually feeding at any given meal. Um, someone was asking, actually several people in my last video, were asking how many people I usually feed on average um, per meal. And it kind of varies because I have two adult kids that still live at home. My other two adult children um, don't live at home anymore. But I have two that still live at home, but they're really not here very much at all. And um, so I'm not feeding them full time, but I'm feeding, I guess, about eight of us on average um, every meal. So that's why I'm always cooking in such large quantities. And most of my kids are teenagers right now, so it's just like, wow they can pack away a serious amount of food. This is going to be delicious. So I do need my phone. Where is my phone? My mom and I have been working on getting all of the recipes, like our family recipes written down. And she just sent me the recipe for this cobbler. Cause I've been making the same cobbler, but kind of variations of it. But this is the exact recipe with the exact measurements of the one that I had when I was a kid. So we're gonna start, we'll double this one though. So we're gonna start with one cup of butter and throw it into our mixer. And I'm just gonna chop that um, butter up just a little bit. It's pretty warm in here, so it's not too firm. One cup of sugar. Okay. Okay, we also need four eggs, a cup of milk. Oh, I have a confession to make, by the way. And this is quite embarrassing, considering I've been cooking for 30 years. But I didn't know until a couple of weeks ago that there was a difference, this is so embarrassing. Oh my goodness, that there was a difference between measuring cups that were supposed to be used for liquid, which the reason this is so embarrassing is because it says milliliters right on there. It also has cups on one side, so it's a fair mistake I feel like. And that this kind was meant for dry ingredients. That's so embarrassing that I didn't know that, but I didn't know that. But I have to say though, one of the things that the commenters that always, that point that out say is that they think it's really funny that I just kind of like measure with whatever and don't pay attention to any of that and the recipes still turn out okay. So I consider that, you know, it's okay. The recipes still taste good. <laughs> it still tastes good even though I apparently have no idea what I'm doing. Okay, we also need some vanilla and some flour and baking powder and salt. What did I say it was again? I said it was one cup of flour, half a cup of milk. So we'll do one cup of milk. Couple teaspoons of vanilla and about a half a teaspoon of salt. Four cups of flour and of course um, the recipe calls for mixing your dry ingredients and then mixing them in with your wet ingredients but as I've mentioned before I almost never do that. Four and a half teaspoons of baking powder Now we'll mix that, and while that is getting mixed up, I think what I'll do is add one peach and one blueberry and then see where we end up for liquid, so. Okay, oh my gosh, that looks beautiful. And smells amazing. So we'll spread that around and see what we have. I think we're definitely gonna add some more peaches to that. There we go. 
And because these blueberries, I actually cooked them down with um, sugar already. So they're, it's already kind of syrupy and sweet. And because we're putting the cake on top, I'm not going to add any extra sugar to this. Oh my goodness, doesn't that look beautiful? Not only does it look beautiful, but it smells like summer. Just reading over my mom's recipe, so I've always added a little bit of flour into this to make it a little bit more of a thicker syrup, but I just read her recipe and she does not have that in hers. And since we're working on sort of getting things perfected and nailed down, I think what I'm gonna do is do this without exactly as my mom, my mom is an awesome cook, so if she does it this way, it's probably the better way. And, um, and then we'll just try it and see. And if we decide that it needs a little bit of flour afterwards, we'll add that in. So we're working on all of these recipes to get them fine-tuned. Did I say this already? I feel like maybe I said this already. Um, but to get them fine-tuned for making a little cookbook for you guys is kind of like a um, companion to the channel so that it's easy to be able to find all of our recipes sourced in one spot. Okay, so when you're making a cobbler, be prepared that when you put the batter on the top of it, all of the fruit won't necessarily be covered. I am going to put a little sprinkle of cinnamon on the top of this, totally unnecessary, but, but does make it look pretty. And the flavor is nice too. You can even put a little sprinkle of sugar on the top of that if you like. Our potatoes are now boiling, which is great. And our ground beef is starting to cook up. And I probably need to load the stove again. When you are cooking in a wood cook stove like this and you're doing things like boiling and frying, it needs to burn pretty hot, so it does go through quite a bit of wood. Fill up my wood bucket again. I use these metal bins for everything. I use them for harvesting in the garden. I use them for wood. And I um, get these at Princess Auto which is one of my favorite farm stores. I buy so many things for the farm from there. This is at 350 and I've set the timer for 20 minutes. So you just wanna cook it until the top is golden brown. So I might need a couple of extra minutes, but um, usually around 20 is perfect. Okay, we'll get our strainer ready for our potatoes. So we're going to make a big batch of mashed potatoes to top our shepherd's pie with. You could definitely make a, um, a crust, like a pastry crust for this and make it kind of more like a meat pie. But uh, my kids love mashed potatoes so much. And so we always do it with mashed potatoes. Plus it's more filling that way too. If you buy these sweet potato crackers from Costco, mm, they're so good. Okay, I'm going to butter around the edge part of this pan all the way around where the um, potatoes and the cheese are going to go because the bottom part's not going to stick where the meat and the gravy are. But I do find that around the sides of this pan, it just makes it easier if you grease it up a little bit. And butter is my fat of choice for this kind of thing. You know what would be really good with these crackers is a couple slices of cheese and some of the red, um, wow, my brain is just not working right now. The red pepper jelly, that's what I was gonna say. That would be really good. Since I'm feeling a little bit 
snackish, I'm going to grab a couple of pieces of cheese and give that a try. This jelly is red pepper and ribboned basil jelly. And I got this recipe out of, let me see if I have the cookbook handy. This cookbook, the Weck Small Batch Preserving. I love this cookbook for small batch kind of stuff, more fancier types of recipes. It's really good. So let's try this out, see if it's tasty. That's quite a big piece of cheese. Mmm, tastes like another one. Oh, that is so yummy. The older I get, the more that I find that food, oh, that's good. Mmm, that food is so connected to memory for me because as soon as I tasted this, I remembered back to being probably 13 or 14 and my friend Christy's mom made red pepper jelly and I loved it so much so I got my mom to get the recipe from her and then my mom started making it and now I make it and I, I love that connection but also love the memories that happen when I taste certain foods. It's just like a jolt. Okay, our mashed potatoes are now ready to be strained and mashed. Okie dokie. And into that is going to go a good chunk or two of butter. And one of my favorite things to put in here, which I forgot to do this time, is roasted garlic. So I'll usually throw in some garlic into the oven around the same time as I start boiling my potatoes and then peel those and throw those in. But I did not do that this time. And I don't have any of my strong potato mashers here to help me get these all mashed up. I like my mashed potatoes to be smooth, but not blended you know, like not kind of immersion blender level blended. I like them to have a little bit of consistency to them. Not chunks, but just not whipped. Okay, we have all of our mashed potatoes mashed up. And take one more cracker. I don't think I have a video with this recipe. I'll look back and if I do, I will link it for you. But next year when I make it, I'll make sure that I do one if I don't have one already. Okay, I'm just gonna go grab our meat. Now I know this is probably kind of weird, but I just mix all my ingredients right in the pan I'm gonna cook in. Okay, we're going to add our tomato paste to here. And one more. Whole bunch of veggies. And we'll add a little bit of beef stock to this. And then to season this, I am going to put in a little bit of garlic powder, a little bit of oregano, parsley, and basil. Mix that all up together. To go fill my salt jar again. Now smooth all this out and now we'll put our mashed potatoes on top. And I put it on really thick because like I said, my children love mashed potatoes. So I 
think this was around 20 to 25 or so potatoes and that's pretty average for us okay and then on top of this I'm going to put some grated cheese and some paprika and we'll just wait till the cobbler's done and then we'll pop it in the oven wow that is a lot of weight in food right there <laughs> I got these little clips at um, Staples the other day when I was buying all my office supplies to use on the tops of my bags that go back into the freezer again. Look at that. Looks amazing. Yum, yum, yum. You definitely want to let your cobbler cool down quite a bit before you start cutting into it just so that it has a chance to set a little bit and now we're going to pop this in the oven it's only four o'clock right now and the kids won't be home to eat until around 5 36 but i'll cook it now and then just keep it on warm so it's ready for them when they come in the door it's time to have a cup of tea but i'll be back with you all when supper is ready all right, we are now back at it. And one of the things that occurred to me when I sat down to have tea is that I was cooking things in the oven when I had my cook stove going and I just haven't quite integrated the cook stove into my kitchen work yet. So I did take the shepherd's pie out of this oven and I went and put it into the cook stove. And now we are going to make some very, very, very simple ice cream. I have done all kinds of fancy types of ice creams before. I've made the custards and I've done all the things, but I actually find that for just a simple fast ice cream, I prefer just using cream, a little bit of sugar, and some vanilla. I don't use egg or anything like that. And I find that it's just nice and smooth. It's not too sweet for about four cups of cream. I use about half a cup of sugar, actually under half a cup of sugar, just over a quarter cup of sugar. So really not too sweet at all. So what I'm doing right now, for those of you that are unfamiliar, is this is um, milk that I milked from my cow. I should have shown you the cream line before I was scooping out. But if you leave your milk in your fridge for 24 hours, then the cream rises to the top and then you can just scoop it off with a ladle. So that is what I'm doing. So that looks good. What we used to do when we were kids is just pour milk on this, kind of like you would porridge, and it's really good. So I've decided that I'm gonna use some honey instead of sugar. Prior to our honey incident that we had where we ended up with that big robbing um, situation that happened with our bees, I actually didn't use sugar in cooking pretty much at all, just used exclusively honey. But because we ended up with all of that um, robbing happening, I started to just use sugar in most of my cooking. And then when we went to Costco a couple weeks ago, we bought a whole bunch of honey and I just haven't kind of gotten back into the habit of using honey for sweetening. I actually much prefer honey in most things. In something like this cobbler, I um, definitely like sugar better. So I am just going to heat this up a little bit to make sure that the sugar in that, or the honey in that rather, is all dissolved. And gosh darn it, I didn't go fill my salt jar up in the pantry. I will do that, but I'm gonna be lazy right now and just use my salt shaker. A little bit of salt in um, something like ice cream actually goes a long way in making it taste really good. And we'll put about a teaspoon of vanilla. This ice cream maker 
because it's a self-contained unit, and I'll show you it in just a second, you don't uh, have to freeze your ingredients first or anything or freeze the canister. That was actually the reason why I bought it because um, I wanted something that I didn't have to think about. So with most ice cream makers, you need to take the container and make sure it's frozen in the freezer and all of that. I wanted something that I could just dump the cream in, put it on the machine and then have ice cream. And this one is like that. It only takes 60 minutes, so I'll show you here. So this just goes in there like so. And then the lid goes on like so. Power. And I want to make ice cream here. So then I just press start. Then it just does its thing. One of my sons came in and stole a little piece of this. So let's give it a try. Um, I think because I used blueberries, and my mom's recipe calls strictly for peaches. It is a little bit runny and I probably should have put some flour in it. Oh my word, but it tastes so good. And because it doesn't have a bunch of added sugar in it, it's not a really sweet um, dessert. I better stop. Mm. Or I'm going to end up eating this for supper. Although you really could because outside of the bit of sugar that's in the cake topping, it's actually not terribly bad for you. Our shepherd's pie is done. Nice and browned on top. All done. And our ice cream is also all done. Doesn't that look tasty? Give it a little taste. Mm. Yum. This is going to be a very yummy meal. My kids are going to be thrilled. Uh, Dan just messaged and said that they're going to be more like 6.30 because they decided to stop at the grocery store first before they came home which means I will just take this ice cream out of here and get it into the freezer. I've let the stove go out now, but it's still nice and warm. So I'm gonna pop this back in so it can just stay warm until the kids get back. I am so sorry, friends, but I completely forgot to bring the camera back out when Dan came home because I got so excited because my freeze dryer was there. <laughs> and so I forgot to show you us plating up dinner and everything. So I'm going to eat a little bit more right now because it's so delicious. And I'm gonna show you what we put on top of it, which I feel like maybe some of you might think is gross, but I assure you it is not. And that is to put some ketchup on the top of your shepherd's pie like so it's really good did you think it was good yeah it is um, really tasty oh this is just so tasty such comfort food is food like this comfort food for you guys like I said I will work on getting measurements for everything for this particular recipe for you and as soon as I have that I will get those to you. I hope that you enjoyed today's video everyone and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Bye!